This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are back here in the studio in Colorado. I've uh, been dealing with a lot of questions from the listeners of the show. We will do that in an upcoming episode. So if you've got questions that you specifically would like for me to answer, we're collecting those up. You can just send them to me as an email at phil at killerinnovations.com. Uh, that email comes directly to me. It doesn't get filtered by anybody. Nobody else sees it. It's a direct connection to me. And submit your questions, and as I said, we're going to post those or actually use those as kind of a sparking point for uh, some upcoming shows. Uh, with today's show, we're taking a little bit of a different spin, right? Given my background, having been the CTO at HP, everybody tends to think that what I want to talk about is technology. It's got to be some kind of a shiny gadget or something, um, uh, something along those lines out of Silicon Valley. But if you've also, if you've been a listener for quite some time, you know that I also have a passion for non-obvious innovations in non-obvious locations. The first uh, business in this case that we highlighted uh, was Finn Gourmet Foods in Paducah, Kentucky. If you didn't listen to that show, go back into the archive. Um, this is a company that actually has created some very innovative technologies to uh, uh, open up an entirely new market opportunity in the fish food processing industry segments in a little town called Paducah, Kentucky, right on the Ohio River. And we actually traveled there. We took the mobile studio and we did the interviews on site. And uh, it's actually uh, was pretty eye opening. So we're going to continue that process of looking for non obvious innovations in non obvious locations. And that's where we come to for today's show. Today's show, we're going to talk about roofing. Now, I know most of you are like, what? We're going to talk about, yes, we're going to talk about roofing today. And the guest I have with us today is Hazit Ganatra from Rematerials. Hazit, thanks for joining us today here on Killer Innovations. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for inviting. So, yeah, so I teed it all up here with the fact that uh, we're going to talk about roofing. And most people don't think of roofing as being all that highly innovative. But before we jump into that, why don't you give us a little bit of your background and how you got to where you are today. Where'd you grow up at? Uh, so Phil, I grew up in uh, India, in a city named Ahmedabad. And uh, uh, growing up, I had never visited uh, a village, you know, or a slum or a low income community. But uh, as my life, you know, moved forward, I ended up in the U.S. also. So I did my master's degree uh, in uh, Los Angeles. And I came back to India in 2008. And that is when my India journey and my journey into the villages began. That was 2008. Yeah, so, in, so what is your degree in? I studied electrical engineering. I studied microchip design, memory design, processor design. <laughs> okay. Yes. So this is going to even be a more interesting conversation. You, you, you're a chip designer that now uh, started a company um, doing uh, roofing for low income. But before that, though, you were part of a startup that was providing solar lights in rural areas also, correct? Exactly. So that was in 2008. I came back to India and uh, I was exploring. And, you know, my mom took me to a vegetable market and she's like, you know, you're not doing anything. You might as well help me carry vegetables back home. And I saw the street vendors. They were all using a rented battery and a CFL light. And, you know, as I observed this o over many days, I thought all this could be solar, you know. They were renting it at a very high cost. They were being exploited. So that was a thought in my head. That was my first encounter talking to somebody from a low-income background. However, very interestingly, I got connected to a, two Caltech graduates uh, based in LA. They wanted to do 
solar lights for rural India and rural Africa. And they said, let's collaborate and let's start a company together. And they had funding and all that from LA. And uh, yeah, then, you know, our journey started. And uh, in absolutely no uncertain terms, uh, that those uh, two to three years that we uh, started and ran the company, it became my education, absolute education, eye opener. It just changed my life. In this case, it's interesting. Um, I've been involved with a couple of other, you know, startups that have been trying to do, for instance, uh, solar lighting in Africa. I do. My wife and I, we have a family venture fund, and we and we invest in entrepreneurs in developing countries. And mm -hmm. you'd be you'd be inter it's, It is it is interesting um, what a, what solving the lighting problem in a low income rural area how transformative that is and it's not just about the labor you know working being able to work more hours or whatever but the impact that it has on education allowing the kids to study you know mm -hmm. by lighting did you see the same thing with your work there in, in india then uh, yes the short answer is yes absolutely but uh I, I have no words. I get goosebumps talking about those days because we would travel to rural India and because of, you know, political scenarios and poor infrastructure, families will have no electricity from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Now, that is the time you need lights in the house <laughs> you know of course during the day also they had intermittent electricity but 6 p.m to 10 p.m was dark all the you know the, the electricity would be diverted to the cities and villages would be dark and that is the time when you you know cook food and eat food and oh, the whole family is at home and all you see is tiny kerosene lamps you know spread across uh, uh, thousands of kilometers i'm not even exaggerating and uh, yeah, you know, that was just shocking, eye-opening. It gives me goosebumps till date that why are we not doing enough? Coming to your point, yes, apart from, you know, just, you know, having enough light in the house, a tiny kerosene lamp is nothing, you know. Yes, kids can study better and families can have more economic activities going on in their house and social activities going on in the house. Uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, it's uh, still the same situation. We need to do a lot more. Well, not, yeah. only, not only that, the whole issue of kerosene light, right? Kerosene is not cheap, right, if you're low income. Mm -hmm. And you also can generate yes. health issues, right, because of the smoke Absolutely. and fumes coming off of the kerosene. It was interesting because we in a village we were working in, in in Rwanda, Africa, we ended up running electricity to one of the businesses we invested in, and we electrified like three villages along the way, right? And we allowed the villages to tap in yeah. individuals' homes. And it was interesting. It wasn't about appliances. It was about lighting. Number one issue for them was about getting lights in their house so that their kids could do their homework, they could do better in school, and pass their exams in order to get into secondary school. They didn't care about a refrigerator or even a radio or a TV. It was all about lighting, which was, which, which was an eye-opener for me because I would have thought of other things. Because we just take lighting, you know, for granted as something that we just all have access to and we, you know, expect it. And, you know, we, we argue about the inconvenience if the lights flicker or if we have a bad storm or something here and we, like, freak out. And here's people who, you know, think that they're doing great when they only, when they only get electricity during, you know, certain times of the day. So, um, so wh whatever happened with the solar company? Is that still going? Are you still involved in it? Or what's the story there? I'm not involved in it. Our investors sold it to an, a different company and uh, we are not involved with it. But uh, now that I'm doing roofing, you know, what can go on top of a roof? A solar panel. Yeah. So it's coming. It's coming. I've, I've not left that. Absolutely not. Uh, and, you know, you make a good point, Phil, that we things that we take for granted when we walk into our house we don't think of our roof we turn on the switch and we have lights and we go into the bathroom and we have hot water and cold water you know and it's just you know we don't think of those things but uh, you know there are 
millions and billions of people who worry about it every single day. Yes. So, so what drove you to go from LA back to uh, back to India? We got a quick twenty seconds here. So give us just a quick answer. What 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 drew you to go back to India coming back from the US? Always, always wanting to solve real problems on the ground, be in the action. You know, I don't want to be a consultant. I don't want to be away from action. So that was my motivation. Yes. Great. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break here, continue our conversation with Azee talking about his company, Rematerials. When we come back from this commercial break, we're going to jump right into what was the problem he, you saw that triggered why you would actually go in and look at roofing, which is not an innovation we typically think about. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back after this quick commercial break. You're listening to Kill Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. Welcome back to Kill Innovations. We're continuing our conversation with Hazi Janatra from Rematerials. Now, I have to ask you, what what possessed you to think about roofing? It's not an area of innovation or in, in a, a solution area that I think about. But you talked about in the last segment about what we take for granted and having and looking at something with fresh eyes. So give us some background on how you even what was the problem you were trying to solve with rematerials? Absolutely. So there are two parts to. Uh, this, uh, you know, to my answer. The first is from my solar lighting days working in rural India, I was exposed to all the problems that rural areas and low-income communities faced. And that just developed, you know, passion in me that, you know, we need to solve these real problems. But after that, you know, uh, more specifically, uh, some of our older investors, they said, you know, we should do this house in a box, you know, a kit house so that, you know, and then we can just ship houses to all over the world from a factory. And uh, of course, that connected to me because I've seen construction activity going on in rural areas all the time. So at that point, the market research started, spread across four states in India, rural areas, urban slums. I talked to 600 families. And what I saw was eye-opening. Uh, I saw that people had built some sort of brick walls, but roofing was consistently poor. And I have data that 80% out of 600 families used corrugated cement sheets and metal sheet roofing. Corrugated cement sheets are just 6 mm thick. They also controversially contain asbestos, which is banned in a lot of countries. And corrugated metal sheets are just 1 mm thick. And as we all know, metal is a good conductor of heat. Now, the living conditions in these houses were horrible because of roofing. In summers, the temperature would go to 45, 48 degrees Celsius, you know, I think 110 Fahrenheit or something what? very hot inside the house. I saw families sitting outside their own house. They said, no, we cannot be in our house. It's like a hot oven. So, you know, not in afternoons. In monsoons, there'll be water leakage inside the house from the roof and their belongings will get wet and all of that. And, you know, the cement sheets and metal sheets will crack and corrode easily. And they'll be like monkeys jumping on top of the roof and they'll throw stuff on the roof. It'll break easily. And I said, oh, my God, this is such a mess, you know. And so many people in India, and now we know abroad also, they use this roofing. And there is just no alternate. And that was the spark. I said, this is such a global problem and a serious problem, and we absolutely need to solve this. And I just decided that I'm going to start a roofing company at that point of time. So, yeah. so the, the, the question that, that, that it begs you is, is, why hasn't anybody else seen this? Well, I mean, see, that goes into the whole idea of, which I still face today, that you know, traditional businesses do not consider rural areas and urban poor, low-income communities as a market opportunity. That is relatively a new concept. 
uh, one of the investors in our company is Dr. C. K. Pralad's family, and he wrote the pioneering book named Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. Mm -hmm. You know, people should read that book. Uh, it talks about this exact same thing. You know, so it's a new idea that a very large market opportunity exists at the bottom of the economic pyramid if we tap it in the right manner. So that I think, yeah, people are realizing it only now. Yes. Yeah, and it's actually interesting because the, the book you mentioned, I've read it. I've actually talked about it here in the show a number of years ago. And that's what <laughs> okay. actually, and that book actually prompted my wife and I to shift our investments from the traditional startup phases and really to invest in entrepreneurs in developing countries. It, 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 is, these, it is this untapped plus the scarcity of uh, risk capital to even invest. So in this case, you know, when I'm like when I travel and I'm in, you know, developing countries, the roofing material just seems to be material of opportunity, meaning they they take whatever they can find, right? Which is out of convenience and corrugated steel, which is what's heavily used in in um, the the rural parts of Africa is because they literally cut the sides off of containers you know, and then yes. plop it and plop it onto the roof, and that becomes. The, and like you said, I've been in those houses. The heat on the yes. thing is un unbelievable. But okay, so in this case, you've identified this opportunity. You've identified it as not as what I would call, um, you know, it's not a charity model. You are a for-profit business trying yes. to solve this at scale, right? Yes, a absolutely, and that. That is my core idea that for-profit businesses are possible, uh, you know, if you cater to uh, rural areas and urban poor and, you know, underserved segments, it is absolutely possible to have impact and profit together. That is the premise of our uh, venture and a core idea that I believe in. Yes. So real quick then, what, give us a little peek into what is so what's different about your roofing solution versus what they have today with the corrugated with the corrugated steel or concrete roofing what's different about yours so uh, you know we knew right away that we needed to provide four key properties we needed to provide strength heat insulation waterproofing and aesthetics and that is where we got started with our journey uh, we have a solution now which we've installed at uh, several hundred houses and our roofs actually lower the temperature in the house by 6 to 10 degrees Celsius. They're completely waterproof. They're strong. Families sleep on top, eat on top. They can do activities on top, store things on top. And they look beautiful, which is very important. You know, people value their homes a lot. They have an emotional connect to their houses. And we have to give them beautiful houses. We provide them with LED lights inside their house. We provide them with wooden carvings inside their house and make it, uh, you know, something that they feel proud of, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's interesting because, again, it, it's also this perception of serving a product into the uh, low income part of the, the economy. We tend to discount that, right? It's typically just aimed at being cheap. Right. Versus yes. treating these people with the same respect. They don't have any less desires than any of us all have. Right. Of having nice furniture, nice house, you know, provide for our kids, help our kids be successful. You know, they're dealing with the exact same motivations we have. And we need to think and treat them with that same level of respect. So absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And so we're going to take another quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to get into a little bit more about how the pro how this idea moved forward early customer feedback, and then I'm going to ask Azit to share us with his uh, one area of, of advice based on the experience he's had uh, going through the building of uh, rematerials and starting this company. So don't go anywhere, but we'll be right back. You're listening to Killer Innovations. Welcome back to Killer Innovations. We're here with Azit Ganatra from Rematerials talking about roofing as an area of innovation. Now, I have to tell you, what you just shared in the previous segment, I got the goosebumps because of your sensitivity to the respect that all customers deserve, no matter where they are on the pyramid. Talk a little bit about 
the the start of the project up through kind of your first customers. How how long did that take, and what uh, what was that whole process? What was that experience like? Sure. Uh, so when the when when the spark, you know, that we have to do. Uh, alternate roofing, you know, that started and we knew that we had to provide four key properties of strength, waterproofing, insulation and aesthetics. Uh, we started looking at the materials because what will this new roof be made of, right? We can talk about all these things. And then the whole materials exploration started and, uh, uh, you know, I thought that we'll have a roof installed in uh, six months and then you know we'll raise money and we'll uh, go from there but uh, it took uh, two years to install our first uh, demo roof you know you have you you probably know you've yeah, done startups yeah. you, you, you know you, that journey you, very well yeah you're, you're you're living the innovator's dream right We're, yes, all, in, all innovators are optimists we believe we can do it so fast and then and then it just takes a lot longer than planned okay so this took you two years to get to that first uh, first install <laughs> First roof, but there were two key elements, uh, you know, of innovation, which I really want to share. The first was the materials. There was always this idea that we can develop a new material, but we were trying off the shelf materials. And when those did not work, we started new materials development. I gathered around 15 types of waste materials in the backyard of the kitchen and started experimenting with uh, those. The engineers training came very handy because we are good problem solvers, right? And then out of those 15 waste materials, we developed a roofing material that was made from cardboard waste and agricultural waste like uh, coconut fibers and, and, you know, completely natural biodegradable roofing tile came out of it. And that was a hard journey, uh, you know, to make the material we needed machines. Where do you get machines? You need money. Nobody would rent machines. Went through that whole journey. Uh, the second aspect is uh, coming was coming up with a modular design. You know, we knew that the roof had to be modular because then it is easy to ship. You know, we have to ship it to remote areas, to rural areas in very crowded urban slums. It has to be very easy to install. Who is going to install these roofs, right? We want to install millions of roofs across the world and then we need skilled workers and all of that. So we came up with the modular design, very easy to install. The roof can be installed in less than a day uh, by semi-skilled, unskilled workers also. So those two innovations, uh, took more than two years. And then finally, our first roof, you know, was installed in a low-income community in uh, Ahmedabad in uh, middle of 2015. And that was just felt great. <laughs> yeah. So how many, how many roofs have you installed now? So as of right now, we have 150 plus roofs installed in uh, slums uh, of uh, Ahmedabad primarily. So we have uh, gone far. Uh, a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, um, a sort of a milestone or a learning in the journey was when we started sales. You know, it's a very common question. People are like, well, how do you even sell to these people? Do they even have money? How do you reach to them? We started sales and we realized that some people were able to, uh, and some said that we love your product, but we don't have, you know, uh, $800, $500 upfront. And that point, we started partnering with microfinance companies. So right now, our roofs are sold in cash. There are families that pay cash, which has been a revelation to us and to our investors and to the world also, that they actually have cash, you know, just do not discount them. And half of the customers get their uh, roofs financed from microfinance companies, and they just have to pay uh, $30 a month, you know, and they get a high quality roofing in return. Yes. And what is the average cost of a roof? Is it the $500 you mentioned? Or what, what, if you had to say, I know average is always hard, but what would you say the average cost in, in U.S. dollars terms? Uh, what, would, average what would a roof cost? cost? is uh, 700 to $800, $700 or so uh, for a 250 to 300 square feet house. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, our goal was never 
to be cheapest in the market. Our goal was to be the best in the market. There is difference between being low cost and being cost effective. And, you know, we had to find the right trade-offs and give them the properties, high quality roofing for uh, developing world is the mission of our company. So we did not want to cut down, cut corners anywhere. Yeah. So here's, here's, so here's the question. What's the future look like for uh, rematerials? What, what's next for you? So we are expanding our mission, going from high quality roofs, we want to go to high quality houses. So we have recently prototyped a full house, you know, uh, very quick to install from our materials developed from waste materials, high quality, very fast to install. And then we have also prototyped solar into the roofing. Shelter, imagine shelter. You need good walls and good roof and you need electricity in the house and sanitation and so on and so forth. So the, the absolute idea is uh, to solve all these uh, basic necessities that are currently not being uh, solved. Yes. So you've been on this journey now for three, what, three and a half years. Um, what... If if there's a, if a listener is thinking about trying to do the same thing you did, what would be that one piece of advice you would give them now that you've, you're on this side of that learning curve? I think uh, uh, it's a business. You have to be smart about it and run it like a startup. But before everything, you have to know if you are truly passionate about working, living, working in rural parts, any part of the world, it's going to get very hot. There's going to be electricity cuts. There's going to be puddles of water. There's going to be animals. There's going to be, you know, lots of issues and fights and all of that. Most people give up. You just cannot give up in these situations. And that, you know, there will be a time when that will be tested. And, you know, you'll find out. So, you know, figure out, try it, spend time in rural areas, do internships or, you know, take up a job. Figure out if you're passionate about it, if you're willing to give your life to it in no uh, uncertain terms, no other words. And only then you will succeed, only then you will make a dent. This cannot be a hobby project. You know, oh yeah, we'll install 500 roofs, we did great for the world and then we'll shut down. No, you know, your goal has to be to reach globally. There are people... Uh, in so many countries that need so many of these basic, basic uh, infrastructure and services. So it requires no more than 100% commitment. So figure that out first and then, uh, you know, then start. I think you bring, that's an excellent point because we've seen a lot of people go, you know, get all, uh, you know, interested in social innovation, but then they don't, they don't stick it through. They don't actually yes. drive the, the longer impact. So, if people want to get in contact with, with you and they want to follow up with what you're doing, what's the best place for them to track you down? We, we, uh, so our product is called Mod Roof. I mean, it's like modular roof, but then our customers call it Modern Roof. So our website is mod, M-O-D-R-O-O-F, modroof.in, I-N. And uh, that's the best place. My email address is there on the website so they can get in touch with us through that. Yes. Well, Hazit, I do appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to join us today here at Kill Innovations. What you're doing and the passion you have for this is inspirational. And I uh, would love to keep stay in touch and follow with what you're doing. And if I happen to be in your parts of the world, I'll definitely uh, we'll do a stop by and maybe actually uh, do the show again. But we'll do it from uh, uh, from India. Keep up the work. There's op opportunities for the people that the lower end of the pyramid. We can we can solve those innovations, and I just wanted to say thanks a lot for uh, taking the time to join us today and telling us your story. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much. So as we wrap up this segment of the show, don't forget, stay tuned. Fourth segment's coming up. That's the five minutes to new ideas. We have a new one for this week, so you're gonna want to stay right where you're at. And listen to that. Everything that we talked about in the first three segments of the show will be in the show notes. We'll have links to uh, Madros, Hazit, so you can track him down. And, and reach out. When, when innovators are doing this kind of hard work, just getting an email from somebody from somewhere else in the world saying, great job, can go a long way. So reach out and let other in, and encourage other innovators that you may know or may hear about and encourage them in their work. And with that, we're going to wrap up this segment of the show. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back 
With five minutes to new ideas, I'm Phil McKinney. This is Killer Innovations. Back in the early days of this show, I would share what I called a killer question in each episode. These questions were designed to be used in your personal team or organization innovation efforts. Now, based on feedback from listeners like you, we've decided to bring it back with some improvements. Each episode of the Killer Innovations has a segment that I'm now calling Five Minutes to New Ideas. They are designed for the creative mind looking for that next great idea. Each episode will challenge you to think differently about your business, your products, your services, and yourself by asking unique, funny, and sometimes crazy questions. These questions are designed to force you to look beyond the obvious and to uncover those ideas and opportunities you never before considered. So, get out your notebook and be ready to uncover that game-changing idea. Here is 5 Minutes to New Ideas. Do you need to have a finished product in order to make a sale? Is there any way that not offering a finished product would actually give you an advantage or even become a selling point? Now, my children have long since outgrown toys, but my grandkids have more than once roped me into visits to Build-A-Bear. Build-A-Bear, like the paint-your-own-pottery craze that preceded it, doesn't offer a finished product. In fact, the whole selling point is that you create your own customized product in-store. These types of businesses are offering a dual product, both the end result, be it a stuffed animal and a personalized costume, or an I Love Papa coffee mug and the chance to create something without taking responsibility for gathering materials or cleaning up the mess it generates. A stuffed toy may feel like a low-risk product, but children's fads can be as fickle as an adult's. Just ask any parent. Once you start adding the layers of design, complexity to a toy, clothes, accessories, pre-recorded sounds, you risk creating something that misses the mark with your target audience. Build-A-Bear's strategy is very clever in that it allows them to keep components rather than finished products as inventory. They never have to run the risk of being stuck with 10,000 astronaut bears the week after the last Pirates of the Caribbean opens. There are two points to take from this. The first is that these companies are reducing their risk of having a stock room full of briefly popular products that they now can't sell. The second is that they are able to charge their customers a premium for the pleasure of assembling the final bear. They've been able to persuade their customers that down is up. They don't offer a fully finished product for sale, and if you do want their product, you will have to assemble it yourself. That is absolute genius. Home bakers have experienced a similar shift in how they make a product. For example, a birthday cake. When I was a kid, my grandma would make me a birthday cake from scratch every year. The cake cost maybe a dollar in commodity goods. Now, when she passed away, my mom took over the job of making my cake. She would go buy a cake mix, add an egg, some oil, and some water, and that was it. Of course, that cake was more expensive because of the convenience factor of having a pre-made cake mix, but you still had to make it yourself. There's a relationship between the amount you're paying and the experience you're getting with these products, and it's more than just simply convenience. Manufacturers have to walk a thin line between making a product so easy that it feels like cheating and so complex the user sees no value in the supposed convenience. When cake mixes first came out, they were really simple. All you had to do was add water. But people making these cakes didn't like it because it felt too easy, like they hadn't contributed anything to it and couldn't claim any pride in making the cake. So cake mixes were altered to require a fresh egg as well, and the products took off. If you want to build this kind of emotional connection with your customer, you need to look at how you can offer them a creative, I did this kind of an experience. There's also a positive customer experience in being able to feel a sense of personal pride in something they've done for themselves. Can you give them an opportunity to take ownership over the construction process? Look at ways in which you can add real value for your customer while simultaneous giving them a lust-finished product 
that then reduces your cost to manufacture and to ship that product? Can you give them the chance to say, I did this? So, can you create an on-demand version of your product? While this sounds easy, it requires you to dissect your product or service and ask yourself, what benefits would you get if you were able to sell your product such that the customer assembles it? Could assembling it be pitched as a learning, bonding, or, or more authentic process? And could you increase the perceived value and hence the cost of your product by emphasizing its real-time availability? It's not always about the finished product. By embedding an experience that solicits a I did this feeling, you could be the one to launch that next on-demand craze. I'm Phil McKinney, and thanks for listening. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join in. If you have any comments or suggestions, drop me a note at phil at killerinnovations.com. Beyond this show, I write about my personal experiences of being in the innovation game for the last two decades. Topics include innovation, creativity, culture, team building, metrics, frustrations, leadership, and how to win. You can find that content over at philmckinney.com. You can also find out information about my book, Beyond the Obvious, including extensive excerpts over at beyondtheobvious.com. You can find hardcover, digital, and audio versions of my book on Amazon or wherever you get your books from. Now, the reason I started this show back in 2005 was to pay back my early mentor. My first mentor, Bob Davis, invested an immense amount of time in training and coaching me, which had a major impact on my career. When I went back and asked him how I could pay him back, he laughed and said I couldn't. I had to pay it forward. If I could ask for a favor, could you help me pay it forward? How? One, by giving us a rating wherever you get your podcast, as that helps spread the word. And two, by telling others about the show. If you want to be part of the conversation between the shows, I hang out in the Innovators community on Slack. The Innovators community is a private community of vetted innovators who help each other succeed. Check it out at theinnovators.community. This episode of Kill Innovations was produced by the Innovators Network. You can find the show notes and the entire show catalog going back to 2005 at killerinnovations.com. I'll talk to you next week, and in the meantime, go out and change the world with your killer innovation. Bye-bye. <laughs>